praise your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sunday school is dismissed at this time. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many have ever heard of Charles Spurgeon? You heard of Charles Spurgeon? You know he was a great, great theologian, interpreter of the Bible, had many commentaries. And he said this many, many, many years ago. What I'm going to show, I'm going to show you a slide that he that he said many, many years ago. Not that one. The other one. He said, there's going to come a time when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. And how true it is. He said that many, many, many years, hundreds of years before. And there are actual churches that have these dramas and skits on Sunday morning rather than the preaching of the word. And they have clowns entertaining people. And we wonder why the church is in the condition that it's in. We wonder why things are going the way that they're going. And it's only getting worse. But I want to share something with you today. And what I want to share with you is, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, what moves you? What moves you? What is your passion? What, are, what is your goals? What is your direction for your life? What makes you passionate? What causes you to react or to act on a certain thing in your life? What is important to you? What moves you? If you look at this illustration of this fish, going from one fish uh, bowl, if you will, to another one. First and foremost, the fish doesn't know what's in the other one. Secondly of all, he doesn't know if he can make it. In other words, he's not going to be in the same environment he was before. He's willing to take the risk to find himself in a new environment. So many times what happens when we, like this little fish, are complacent to stay in the same place and not move beyond our little fish bowls that we have constructed for ourselves. But what is one of the strong characteristics of this little fish? A little goldfish. One of the strong characteristics is that he has no fear. He calculated, he looked at that other bowl of water and said, I think I can make this. And he took a place of swimming and, and a place where he would bring himself to project himself out of the water, hoping that there was enough thrust, that there was enough condition that would move him to the other place and he would make it. But I want you to understand there was still the uncertainty of whether he was going to make it. And I want to share with you this morning the heart of the Apostle Paul and some of the things that he did and what moved him, what was something that stirred him so that we can take those things and we can apply them to our life. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do when you, come to Bible, when you come to Bible study or you come to a Sunday morning service, I hope you have your Bibles with you because... 
I want you to get used to opening the Word because there may come a time when we don't have multimedia anymore. You never know the way this world is going, the way the United States is going. But if you have your Bibles, open them please to the book of Acts, chapter 17. We're going to be starting with verse 16. The scripture says, now while Paul waited for them. Who, does, who was he waiting for? We want to make sure we know who he's waiting for. If you go up to verse 15, you'll see who he's waiting for, Silas and Timotheus. Silas and Timotheus was going to meet him, and they were going to come together. This is now while Paul waited for them at Athens. His spirit was stirred, or moved, or challenged. All he was doing was waiting for two of his comrades to come, to be used in ministry. And what that tells me is the Apostle Paul was redeeming the time. How many of us Christians, as the Bible says, redeeming the time? Because the Lord is near. Redeeming, buying back, taking back, taking control of the time that you and I have. Redeeming the time. I'm sure that during this time where Paul was waiting for Silas and Timotheus to come, Maybe could have put in a video game. Or maybe he could have watched a little TV. Of course, I'm being a little facetious. Those things weren't around then. But he could have been doing something else. But what did, what did Paul, what did grab Paul's heart? What did grab Paul's mind? What did grab Paul's soul? What was his thinking? What did he want to do? It says, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, something from the in it. He didn't allow his outward man or the flesh to stir him. When you allow the flesh to stir you in things, sometimes it's a little self-righteousness. But he waited, and, he, and, he, and his, the Spirit of God that was in him, and his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. We live in a country, we live in a state, we live in a city that tolerates idolatry. We're told that all Christians everywhere worship the same God. And so we become a tolerate, a tolerate nation. And we think that you can still be a Christian and worship idols. You can still be a Christian and pray to idols. You can still be a Christian and bow your knee to idols. But is it the truth? What matters to you and I is not whether the traditions of man or the religions of man, but what matters to you and I is truth. What is truth? And here the Apostle Paul, he's in this city of Athens. By the way, it was named after Athena. Athena was the a special patron of Athens because, after all, it was named after her. And she was a goddess of intelligence. She was a goddess of skill, a goddess of peace, a goddess, a goddess of wisdom. Now, I want you to understand, because as we get into this, you're going to see about these philosophers and these, these people with their ideologies and know a little background of what they were coming from and where they were coming from. But Paul was stirred in the spirit. Let me ask you this. It happens to me when I go by a Catholic church and I see all the people coming out after church. And I see them come out 
by the multitudes coming out of this church on County Street. Have we gotten to the place where we're so tolerant with that, that that doesn't stir our spirit, that they're going to a house of idolatry? Oh, we're quick to pick out the Buddhist temples. And we're quick to pick out the Hindu temples. And we're quick to pick out all the other false gods that are around. But because we've Christianized it and put saints, such as St. Anthony, St. Jude, St. Paul, Peter, and we make statues of them, and we go and marry, and we go and we bow our knee to them, and we pray to them, and yet we still believe in America that we are called Christians because of that. You are not Christian. You are pagan. It's paganism. But we have tolerated it for so long. And when you go by the Catholic Church and you see these people coming out, do you understand for one moment that those people are lost? Well, I got one amen over here. They are lost because they have not been born again. They believe that their salvation is in their baptism when they're a child. Know your Catholic doctrine. They believe in baptismal regeneration. I thank God that I'm not regenerated by water. I'm regenerated by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Dying on that cross is what saved me, not water baptism. Although I get water baptized to come into obedience to what God said and Christ said in his word, but that's not the initial evidence of salvation. As one defender of that doctrine that we're not saved by regeneration, gave an illustration of a person that was in the army. He was in a war. He was in a foxhole. And he was beside an atheist. And the battle was raging, and all of a sudden he looked over, and his, his friend had been shot. And his friend said to him, Listen, I heard you're a Christian. Pray for me. I feel like I'm going to die. So the man prayed for him, led him, into, led him to the Lord. My question was, and is, was that man saved? The one in the foxhole, was he saved? When he gave his life to Jesus, was he saved? Or yes. oh, did this guy have to now, suddenly after, before he died, drag him out of the, the foxhole... Drag him over to a, a pile of water, a pond of water, dip him in so that, hello? I believe Jesus said the same thing he said to the thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. There was no time for water baptism. And here the Apostle Paul, he says, this whole city was given wholly to a goddess of wisdom. Now, I want you to understand, because as we get into this, you're going to see about these philosophers and these, these people with their ideologies and know a little background of what they were coming from and where they were coming from. But Paul was stirred in the spirit. Let me ask you this. It happens to me when I go by a Catholic church and I see all the people coming out after church. And I see them come out. By the multitudes coming out of this church on County Street. Have we gotten to the place where we're so tolerant with that, that that doesn't stir our spirit, that they're going to a house of idolatry? Oh, we're quick to pick out the Buddhist temples. And we're quick to pick out the Hindu temples. And we're quick to pick out all the other false gods that are around. But because we've Christianized it and put saints, such as St. Anthony, St. Jude, St. Paul, Peter, and we make statues of them, and we go and marry, and we go and we bow our knee to them, and we pray to them, and yet we still believe in America that we are called Christians because of that. You are not Christian. You are pagan. It's paganism. 
But we have tolerated it for so long. And when you go by the Catholic Church and you see these people coming out, do you understand for one moment that those people are lost? Well, I got one amen over here. They are lost because they have not been born again. They believe that their salvation is in their baptism when they're a child. Know your Catholic doctrine. They believe in baptismal regeneration. I thank God that I'm not regenerated by water. I'm regenerated by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Dying on that cross is what saved me, not water baptism. Although I get water baptized to come into obedience to what God said and Christ said in his word, but that's not the initial evidence of salvation. As one defender of that doctrine that we're not saved by regeneration, gave an illustration of a person that was in the army. He was in a war. He was in a foxhole. He was beside an atheist. And the battle was raging, and all of a sudden he looked over, and his, his friend had been shot. And his friend said to him, Listen, I heard you're a Christian. Pray for me. I feel like I'm going to die. So the man prayed for him, led him, into, led him to the Lord. My question was, and is, was that man saved? The one in the foxhole, was he saved? When he gave his life to Jesus, was he saved? Or did this guy have to now, suddenly after, before he died, drag him out of the, the foxhole, drag him over to a, a pile of water, a pond of water, dip him in so that, Hello? I believe Jesus said the same thing he said to the thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. There was no time for water baptism. And here the Apostle Paul, he says, this whole city was given wholly to idolatry. Let's look at uh, Psalm 135 for a minute, starting with verse 15. I'm going to go to 15 to 18, but Psalm 135, 15 to 18. The idols of the heathen. That's kind of strong. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Ears have they, but they, uh, eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. In other words, they're dead. As one family came and asked a, a, a workman who was, at work, who was a craftsman in wood, woodwork, they asked him, could you make me a statue of Mary about this tall, out of wood? He said, sure. So he carved this beautiful statue of Mary out of wood and painted it and all that stuff. And then all the other wood that came off of it, he took and he used it for his fireplace. The same wood. So it is so illogical to think that that thing that was made is a God when the very leftover of it was thrown into the fire to keep somebody warm. And you and I will shake our heads and you and I will laugh at these things. You know, how can people be so blind? But we were blind. And I go into the Catholic Church before I was a Christian, and I was a little boy, I, I kneel down and do the whole thing, you know. Pray to Mary. Say, Hail Mary, you know, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, you know, whatever. But that doesn't make me a Christian. 
But we have become so laid back. I will tell you right now, if you think the Muslims are bad, if the true church of Jesus Christ stood up and called white, white, black, black, and said, that is idolatry, and that you're going to hell if you don't repent of your sin because God says he hates idolatry, you'd have more Catholics beating up on Christians. Hello? But we become comfortable. We become laxed. Well, you know, they're Christians, you know. They just, they're just lost in their, in their idolatry. But they're still Christians. No, they're not. The Bible says, what does the temple of God have to do with idols? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. What have you got to do with idols? Don't even bring them in your house unless you become a cursed thing like it, Deuteronomy says. There have been people that have had more demonic manifestations in their home, can't figure out why. Until someone points it out to them, you become a cursed thing like it. Get rid of it. Get it out of your house. But the Apostle Paul was stirred here. He was, he was moved. There was something. It was, it was a holy anger, a holy right, not a self-righteousness. Well, I'm going to go over there and tell them what I know of theology. I'm going to go over there and tell them how wrong they are. No. Paul was stirred because he cared about people. The same one that was murdering people before now has totally did an opposite turnaround and now loves people and wants to see people saved. Do you care about people being saved? Does your heart ache when you see someone that is in idolatry or someone who is in sin And does it hurt you because you know that you have the words of eternal life and and you're just sitting there and you watch them go by day after day, day after day, and you don't open your mouth or say a word? Let me tell you, my friend, when you stand before Jesus, their blood will be upon your head. Hello? Hello? Well, I was afraid. I thought we were of the tribe of Judah. I thought we were of the lion of the tribe of Judah, not the lion of the Wizard of Oz. I'm so afraid. (laughs) No, we're from the lion of the tribe of Judah. We shouldn't be afraid. And look what it says. He saw the entire city, the whole city, given over to idolatry. Athens. I was a little boy. I, I kneeled down and do the whole thing, you know. Pray to Mary. Say, Hail Mary, you know, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, you know, whatever. But that doesn't make me a Christian. But we have become so laid back. I will tell you right now, if you think the Muslims are bad, if the true church of Jesus Christ stood up and called white, white, black, black, and said, that is idolatry, and that you're going to hell if you don't repent of your sin because God says he hates idolatry, You'd have more Catholics beating up on Christians. Hello? But we become comfortable. We become laxed. Well, you know, they're Christians, you know. They just they're just lost in their in their idolatry. But they're still Christians. No, they're not. The Bible says, what does the temple of God have to do with idols? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. What have you got to do with idols? 
Don't even bring them in your house lest you become a cursed thing like it, Deuteronomy says. There have been people that have had more demonic manifestations in their home, can't figure out why. Until someone points it out to them, you become a cursed thing like it. Get rid of it. Get it out of your house. But the Apostle Paul was stirred here. He was, he was moved. There was something. It was, it was a holy anger, a holy right, not a self-righteousness. Well, I'm going to go over there and tell them what I know of theology. I'm going to go over there and tell them how wrong they are. No. Paul was stirred because he cared about people. The same one that was murdering people before now is totally did an opposite <laughs> turnaround and now loves people and wants to see people saved. Do you care about people being saved? Does your heart ache when you see someone that is in idolatry or someone who is in sin? And does it hurt you? Because you know that you have the words of eternal life and, and you're just sitting there and you watch them go by day after day, day after day, and you don't open your mouth or say a word. Let me tell you, my friend, when you stand before Jesus, their blood will be upon your head. Hello? Well, I was afraid. I thought we were of the tribe of Judah. I thought we were of the lion of the tribe of Judah, not the lion of the Wizard of Oz. I'm so afraid. <laughs> no, we're from the lion of the tribe of Judah. We shouldn't be afraid. And look what it says. He saw the entire city, the whole city, given over to idolatry. Athens. The Athenia. The goddess of intelligence. Tell me we haven't done that in America. We haven't bowed our knee to intelligence. And skill and peace and wisdom of this world. So what did Paul do? What did he do? He sat there and prayed for them, right? No. He didn't just sit and do nothing. You know what burns my spirit? Is to see Christians doing nothing but what they want to do. They excel in their vocation and in in what they want to do and where they want to go and what they want to become, but they don't excel in the things of God. His spirit was stirred. Something was happening in him. Something was beginning to overtake him. It was an indignation. Why the devil had such authority over the city. Of course, you know, the Greeks came in and overtook through Alexander the Great. The people of God and changed their language to Greek and they were forced to worship these idols and these many, many idols. There's many gods. Dionysus was a god. God of wine, parties and festivals, madness, chaos, drunkenness, drugs and ecstasy. Tell me that god ain't being served today. Hello?
is a god of hypnos, or the god of sleep, where we get the English word hypnotis, hypnotize. I see Christians getting hypnotized. I say, my God, what are you doing? Giving yourself over to a God of, that puts you to sleep and takes over your will? Even the God of all gods, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, doesn't put you to sleep and take over your will. People through hypnosis go into a trance and these doctors make them say things and do things and when they come out of it, they won't remember a thing, but they'll do what the doctor said. That's control. So what did Paul do with all these different gods? And most of them, the statues of them are half naked. I had to blot out some of the pictures. If I, could, I could show you, I put a little skirt on this one. I don't want to see that stuff. There was a god of, stuff, a god of Apollos, god of music, arts, knowledge, healing, Plagues, prophecy, poetry, all of these things. Paul was seeing all of these. It's like going into a Hindu temple. Now, when I was in India, I saw a Hindu temple. And outside of the temple, there were hundreds of gods. Little statues of hundreds of gods. And I'm trying to get you to understand, this is what Paul was seeing on these temples and seeing these statues and seeing all these gods and goddesses uh, uh, that were all around him. And in verse 17 he says this, Therefore, because of that, because he was stirred, because he could not take it, it was an indignation, a righteous indignation in him. That he couldn't just sit there and do nothing. He had to do something. You know what burns my spirit? Is to see Christians doing nothing but what they want to do. They excel in their vocation and in in what they want to do and where they want to go and what they want to become, but they don't excel in the things of God. His spirit was stirred. Something was happening in him. Something was beginning to overtake him. There was an indignation why the devil had such authority over the city. Of course, you know, the Greeks came in and overtook through Alexander the Great the people of God and changed their language to Greek and they were forced to worship these idols and these many, many idols. There's many gods. Dionysus was a god. God of wine, parties and festivals, madness, chaos, drunkenness, drugs and ecstasy. Tell me that God ain't being served today. Hello? There's a God of hypnos, or the God of sleep, where we get the English word hypnotis, hypnotize. I see Christians getting hypnotized. I say, my God, what are you doing? giving yourself over to a God of, that puts you to sleep and takes over your will. Even the God of all gods, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, doesn't put you to sleep and take over your will. People through hypnosis go into a trance and they, these doctors make them say things and do things and when they come out of it, they won't remember a thing, but they'll do what the doctor said. That's control. So what did Paul do with all these different gods? And most of them, the statues of them are half naked. I had to blot out some of the pictures. If I could, I could show you, I put a little skirt on this one. I don't want to see that stuff. I 
It was a god of, a god of Apollos. God of music, arts, knowledge, healing, plagues, prophecy, poetry, all of these things. Paul was seeing all of these. It's like going into a Hindu temple. Now, when I was in India, I saw a Hindu temple. And outside of the temple, there were hundreds of gods. Little statues of hundreds of gods. I'm trying to get you to understand this is what Paul was seeing on these temples and seeing these statues and seeing all these gods and goddesses uh, uh, that were all around him. And in verse 17 he says this. Therefore, because of that, because he was stirred, because he could not take it, it was an indignation, a righteous indignation in him. That he couldn't just sit there and do nothing. He had to do something. Therefore, he began to dispute them in the synagogue with the Jews. What? You mean the philosophies and the ideologies of all of these foreign gods had an influx into the Jewish synagogue? Yeah. Just like the world is having influence in the church. There's a goddess of entertainment. Did you know that? And we serve a goddess of entertainment right here in America. Two big gods, two big statues of gods we serve. One is called California, Hollywood. Where the movies come out. The other is Disney World. Well, we give our money to them. Sometimes we give more of a tithe to them than we do to the church. This movie, that movie, this entertainment, that entertainment. What's God going to say to you? You had a neighbor that had no food. You could have fed. Did you feed him? Oh, I can't afford to feed him. Why? Because you spent... 50 bucks this month on movies. Hello? I'm not saying you can't spend money on movies. But what moves you? What's going to motivate you? Therefore he disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. He didn't do it just as a one-time thing. Now, you can have a food drive, and you can do all that stuff and do it as a one-time thing. Big deal. Now, there's an old saying, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, but if you teach him how to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. So this wasn't just a stirring of an emotional stirring, you know, like you come and church, oh, thank you, Jesus, oh! God, you're, you're so powerful. How great is our God? Oh, hallelujah. Then you go home and then something happens. Oh, God, where are you? It's a fleeing thought. No, it's a reality of who God is. When you get that into your spirit, man, and into your heart, and you believe it. Can I tell you there's a difference between believing something and understanding something? You don't have to understand something to believe something. Did you know that? I believe in thermodynamics. Ask you to explain it. I don't know about it. I can't understand that stuff. I believe in physics, but I, can't under, I, can't, I don't understand it. I don't know. I can't explain it to you. I believe in a plant, but I can't tell you exactly the whole intricacies of how that thing grows by just putting water in a piece of plastic with dirt in it. I don't need to understand that. But I can believe. So here he was in the marketplace daily with them, and he met with them, and he was teaching them, and he was, he was telling them and, and disputing with them. And verse 18 says, Then certain philosophies, 
of the Epicureans and of the Stoics. Something. Therefore, he began to dispute them in the synagogue with the Jews. What? You mean the philosophies and the ideologies of all of these foreign gods had an influx into the Jewish synagogue? Yeah. Just like the world is having influence in the church. There's a goddess of entertainment. Did you know that? And we serve a goddess of entertainment right here in America. Two big gods, two big statues of gods we serve. One is called California, Hollywood, where the movies come out. The other is Disney World. Hello? We give our money to them. Sometimes we give more of a tithe to them than we do to the church. This movie, that movie, this entertainment, that entertainment. What's God going to say to you? You had a neighbor that had no food. You could have fed. Did you feed him? Oh, I can't afford to feed him. Why? Because you spent 50 bucks this month on movies. Hello? I'm not saying you can't spend money on movies. But what moves you? What's going to motivate you? Therefore he disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. He didn't do it just as a one-time thing. No, you can have a food drive and you can do all that stuff and do it as a one-time thing. Big deal. Now, there's an old saying, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, but if you teach him how to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. So this wasn't just a stirring of an emotional stirring, you know, like you come in church, oh, thank you, Jesus, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, you're, you're so powerful, how great is our God, oh, hallelujah. Then you go home and then something happens, oh, God, where are you? It's a fleeing thought, no, it's a reality of who God is. When you get that into your spirit, man, and into your heart, and you believe it, can I tell you, there's a difference between believing something and understanding something? You don't have to understand something to believe something. Did you know that? I believe in thermodynamics. Ask you to explain it? I don't know about it. I can't understand that stuff. I believe in physics, but I, can't under I, can't, I don't understand it. I don't know. I can't explain it to you. I believe in a plant, but I can't tell you exactly the whole intricacies of how that thing grows by just putting water in a piece of plastic with dirt in it. I don't need to understand that. But I can believe. So here he was in the marketplace daily with them, and he met with them, and he was teaching them, and he was, con he was telling them and, and disputing with them. And verse 18 says, Then certain philosophies of the Epicureans and of the Stoics. The Epicureans regarded belief in religion as irrational and superstitious. That's where they were coming from. Religion is ir irrational and is it has involved superstition. So that was their philosophy. They also believed that the ultimate good in life was happiness and sensual pleasure. I don't know if you saw my Facebook. I put something on that book called Your Best Life Now. <laughs> That's the same thing. I don't want my best life now. Jesus said, he who finds his life shall lose it. 
But he that loses his life shall find it. I don't want my best life. If this is my best life now, ooh. Getting old, getting fat, hair's getting less and less. That's my best life? Things are sagging, things are hanging. Come on. That's my best life? You women know what I'm talking about because you've got to put makeup on all over the face to make it look good. Hello? And men want you to. <laughs> but tell me that's not what's going on in a lot of churches today. The only thing they're concerned about is life was happiness and sensual pleasure. Do you see that all through the Greek culture? Sensual pleasure. Look at all the statues, half naked. I've got to cover some of them up. And we'll go, we won't go to the other parts, too, because they do some weird stuff. The Stoics, they were pantheistic. You know what that means? How many know what pantheistic means? Okay, one person, two people. Okay, good. How many else want to know what pantheistic means? Raise your hand. Okay, look it up. Hey, right, pastor, telling me to look it up. Yes, it is. You look everything else up. If you need a recipe, you look that up. If you need to find out what a drug is, you look that up. Come on! If you want to know if somebody's right or wrong, you look that up. My God, I can't even make a mention of a hot dog on, a, on the Facebook. I've got to go through all kinds of things. I said, I like hot dogs. All of a sudden, this, this person wrote this big, long uh, uh, dissertation about what's in hot dogs. I said, my God, I'll never eat another hot dog as long as I live. Then all of a sudden we started to have a hot dog debate. I don't need to understand that. But I can believe. So here he was in the marketplace daily with them and he met with them and he was teaching them and he was, con he was telling them and, and disputing with them. And verse 18 says, Then certain philosophies of the Epicureans and of the Stoics. The Epicureans regarded belief in religion as irrational and superstitious. That's where they were coming from. Religion is ir irrational and is it has involved superstition. So that was their philosophy. They also believed that the ultimate good in life was happiness and sensual pleasure. I don't know if you saw my Facebook. I put something on that book called Your Best Life Now. <laughs> That's the same thing. I don't want my best life now. Jesus said, he who finds his life shall lose it. But he that loses his life shall find it. I don't want my best life. If this is my best life now, ooh. Getting old, getting fat, hair's getting less and less. That's my best life? <laughs> things are sagging, things are hanging. Come on. That's my best life? You women know what I'm talking about because you've got to put makeup on all over the face to make it look good. Hello? And men want you to. <laughs> but tell me that's not what's going on in a lot of churches today. The only thing they're concerned about is life was happiness and sensual pleasure. Do you see that all through the Greek culture? 
sensual pleasure. Look at all the statues, half naked. I've got to cover some of them up. And we'll go, we won't go to the other pots, too, because they do some weird stuff. The Stoics, they were pantheistic. You know what that means? How many know what pantheistic means? Okay, one person, two people. Okay, good. How many else want to know what pantheistic means? Raise your hand. Okay, look it up. Hey, right, Pastor, telling me to look it up. Yes, it is. You look everything else up. If you need a recipe, you look that up. If you need to find out what a drug is, you look that up. Come on. If you want to know if somebody's right or wrong, you look that up. My God, I can't even make a mention of a hot dog on, a, on the Facebook. I've got to go through all kinds of things. I said, I like hot dogs. All of a sudden, this, this person wrote this big, long uh, 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 dissertation about what's in hot dogs. I said, my God, I'll never eat another hot dog as long as I live. <laughs> then all of a sudden, we started to have a hot dog debate. <laughs> so what I did was I, I did what Proverbs says, you know, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to elect this person to the CEO of American Hot Dogs. <laughs> Silence the argument. I don't want to argue about hot dogs. Because I like hot dogs, I'm going to eat them anyway. <laughs> Whether they're all natural, kosher, whatever they are, I don't care. I'm going to eat a hot dog. But the Stoics, oh boy, they were something, man, I'll tell you. They, you know, they, they uh, let me find it here. Pantheistic means that they believe God is in everything. I told you, okay, but look it up for yourself. And emphasize living in harmony and unity with nature. You've got all these butterflies flying around, you know, about nature and being one with nature, mother nature and all kinds of nature. You've got to be part of nature. You've got to make yourself the tree if you want to understand about the tree. and If you want to understand about the rock, make yourself like a rock and just, you know, be one with nature. Because if you're one with nature, then you're one with God, you know. You can just, just harmonize and flow and just, you know, become one with nature. And everything's nature now. Everything, you've got to have everything go to the nature food store and go and get this and get all homeopathic medicine and all this. Everything's nature. That's what they were, the Stoics. And they encountered Paul. They came and they encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Now, when you and I think of the word babbler, you think of someone that just mumbles on and on and on and on. How many have experienced a babbler? Ah. Let me find my paper. Where's my paper? Oh, here it is. How many know that... In the Greek, sometimes words mean different things. Well, the word babla in the Greek means picking up seed. Picking up seed. Of birds, especially of the crow that draws and picks up grain in the fields and stuff. But metaphorically, metaphorically it means lounging about the marketplace and picking up a substance by whatever may chance to fall from the loads of merchandisers. Uh, hence a beggarly abject, vile, getting a living by flattery and buffoonery, an empty talker. It was one of the lowest... Hey, right, Pastor, telling me to look it up. Yes, it is. You look everything else up. If you need a recipe, you look that up. If you need to find out what a drug is, you look that up. Come on. If you want to know if somebody's right or wrong, you look that up. 
My God, I can't even make a mention of a hot dog on, a, on the Facebook. I got to go through all kinds of things. I said, I like hot dogs. All of a sudden, this, this person wrote this big, long uh, 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 dissertation about what's in hot dogs. I said, my God, I'll never eat another hot dog as long as I live. <laughs> then all of a sudden, we started to have a hot dog debate. <laughs> so what I did was I, I did what Proverbs says, you know, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to elect this person to the CEO of American Hot Dogs. <laughs> Silence the argument. I don't want to argue about hot dogs. Because I like hot dogs, I'm going to eat them anyway. <laughs> Whether they're all natural, kosher, whatever they are, I don't care. I'm going to eat a hot dog. But the Stoics, oh boy, they were something, man, I'll tell you. They, you know, they, they uh, let me find it here. Pantheistic means that they believe God is in everything. I told you, okay, but look it up for yourself. And emphasize living in harmony and unity with nature. Got all these butterflies flying around, you know, about nature and being one with nature, mother nature, and all kinds of nature. And you got to be part of nature. You got to make yourself the tree if you want to understand about the tree. And if you want to understand about the rock, make yourself like a rock and just, you know, be one with nature. Because if you're one with nature, then you're one with God, you know. You can just just harmonize and flow and just, you know, become one with nature. And everything's nature now. Everything, you've got to have everything go to the nature food store and go and get this and get all homeopathic medicine and all this. Stuff. Everything's nature. That's what they were, the Stoics. And they encountered Paul. They came and they encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler Say. Now, when you and I think of the word babbler, you think of someone that just mumbles on and on and on and on. How many have experienced a babbler? Ah. Let me find my paper. Where's my paper? Oh, here it is. How many know that in the Greek, sometimes words mean different things? Well, the word babbler in the Greek means picking up seed. Picking up seed of birds, especially of the crow that draws and picks up grain in the fields and stuff. But metaphorically, metaphorically it means lounging about the marketplace and picking up a substance by whatever may chance to fall from the loads of merchandisers. Uh, hence a beggarly abject, vile, getting a living by flattery and buffoonery, an empty talker. It was one of the lowest ridicules a person could be called a babbler. It was one who didn't work for a living that was just trying to make money off of what he philosophized and what he said. And him being in the marketplace was not really the, the coolest thing because that's where all the babblers would go. Because they knew that if somebody dropped a piece of bread or something like that, they weren't going to pick it up. You know, they would go and pick it up and they would eat, uh, eat, take that. So they were like a vagabond. They were kind of like, you know, a homeless person trying to get things, you know. So Paul was called that. What will this babbler say? You can hear the pride and the arrogance of the tone of the voice. It's amazing how you can pick up, even in writing, sometimes the tone of, the, of what a person's going through by what they say. Or if they say, if, they, if they say things to you, you know, if you have a conversation in writing back and forth with a person, after a while you get to know that person. Like there was a person, I won't mention who it is, there was a person that was texting me, and I was texting this person. And I asked the person, I said, are you aggravated? And they wrote back and said, how do you know that? Well, how I know that is because of the other ways that you text, you know, they text me. 
and how they, they write in our correspondence. Not that I'm reading into it. I don't want to do that. But you can tell. And see, that's what we need to do with God's word. We need to know what the writing is, what the intensity of that person was, was saying. So here they're calling this guy, you know, Paul, these things. And others, some, he seemed to be a setter of forth of strange gods. Why was he strange? First of all, he wasn't talking, namely about polytheistic belief, believing in more than one God. He believes in one God, existing in three persons. Did you know that Paul believed in the Trinity? He wasn't preaching some strange gods. It was strange to them because of all of the gods that they worshipped and they served. And because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And what he was doing is with the person of Jesus, he was, he was confronting them with reality and truth. Now, see, I don't, I, you know, people will say, well, you know, there was a... St Let me find my paper. Where's my paper? Oh, here it is. How many know that in the Greek, sometimes words mean different things? Well, the word babla in the Greek means picking up seed. Picking up seed of birds, especially of the crow that draws and picks up grain in the fields and stuff. But metaphorically, metaphorically it means lounging about the marketplace and picking up a substance by whatever may chance to fall from the loads of merchandisers. Uh, hence a beggarly abject, vile. Getting a living by flattery and buffoonery. An empty talker. It was one of the lowest ridicules a person could be called a babbler. It was one who didn't work for a living that was just trying to make money off of what he philosophized and what he said. And him being in the marketplace was not really the, the coolest thing because that's where all the babblers would go. Because they knew that if somebody dropped a piece of bread or something like that, they weren't going to pick it up. You know, they would go and pick it up and they would eat, that, eat take that. So they were like a vagabond. They were kind of like you know, a homeless person trying to get things, you know. So Paul was called that. What will this babbler say? You can hear the pride and the arrogance of the tone of the voice. It's amazing how you can pick up, even in writing sometimes, the tone of, the, of what a person's going through by what they say. Or if they, say, if, they, if they say things to you, you know, if you have a conversation in writing back and forth with a person, after a while you get to know that person. Like there was a person, I won't mention who it is, but there was a person that was texting me and I was texting this person. And I asked the person, I said, are you aggravated? And they wrote back and said, how do you know that? Well, how I know that is because of the other ways that you text you know, they text me and how they, they write in our correspondence. Not that I'm reading into it. I don't want to do that. But you can tell. And see, that's what we need to do with God's word. We need to know what the writing is, what the intensity of that person was, was saying. So here they're calling this guy, you know, Paul, these things. And others, some, he seemed to be a setter of forth of strange gods. Why was he strange? First of all, he wasn't talking namely about polytheistic belief, believing in more than one God. He believes in one God, existing in three persons. Did you know that Paul believed in the Trinity? He wasn't preaching some strange gods. It was strange to them 
because of all of the gods that they worshipped and they served. And because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And what he was doing is with the person of Jesus, he was, he was confronting them with reality and truth. Now see, I don't, I, you know, people will say, well, you know, there was a statue that cried. And there was a statue that these little children saw. Was it Fatima? Is that the one that they saw? A Madonna or something? I don't know what they saw. Some people pay tickets to go see Madonna. I don't know. I wouldn't. But whatever that statue was or whatever that vision in the sky those kids saw, just because they're kids, why do we validate that as true? I don't care. God's word says if an angel himself comes and preaches any other gospel, don't believe it. That's an angel. What about a little kid? He preached Jesus and the resurrection. He preached Jesus. He preached about his birth. How his name was Emmanuel, God with us. He preached through what John said. Jesus was the word in the beginning and he was with God and he was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And they took him and he came as the Savior and as the Messiah of the world. Remember, he's talking to Jews too. He's Jesus, the Messiah. And that he rose from the dead according to what Isaiah said. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. He was preaching the whole gamut, if you will, about Jesus and the resurrection. So they thought he was strange. Think about it for a moment. If you were in a society... Say you were Jewish and you grew up in the synagogue, you were taught the, you know, the Torah, you were taught all of the things of the Jewish religion, and you taught that uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I came to you and told you, hey, come on, I want to meet, I want to show you a man who's God in human flesh. What are you going to call me? You're nuts! There's something wrong with you. How could God be in human flesh? You understand what I'm saying? Didn't make sense to them. But I told you, you don't have to understand something to believe something. Next verse, please. And they took him and they brought him unto Aropagus. Aropagus is a word that means Mars Hill. It's a place of high authority, a place where all of their law was decided. It was like the Supreme Court of the United States. They brought him there saying, may we know what this new... And see, that's what we need to do with God's word. We need to know what the writing is, what the intensity of that person was, was saying. So here they're calling this guy, you know, Paul, these things. And others, some, he seemed to be a setter or forth of strange gods. Why was he strange? First of all, he wasn't talking... Namely about polytheistic belief, believing in more than one God. He believes in one God existing in three persons. Did you know that Paul believed in the Trinity? Hmm. He wasn't preaching some strange gods. It was strange to them because of all of the gods that they worshipped and they served. And because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And what he was doing is with the person of Jesus, he was, he was confronting them with reality and truth. Now see, I don't, I, you know, people will say, well, you know, there was a statue that cried. And there was a statue that these little children saw. Was it Fatima? Is that the one that they saw? A Madonna or something? I don't know what they saw. Some people pay tickets to go see Madonna. I don't know. I wouldn't. But whatever that statue was or whatever that vision in the sky those kids saw, just because they're kids, why do we validate that as true? I don't care. God's word says if an angel himself comes and preaches any other gospel, don't believe it. That's an angel. What about a little kid? 
He preached Jesus and the resurrection. He preached Jesus. He preached about his birth. How his name was Emmanuel, God with us. He preached through what John said. Jesus was the word in the beginning and he was with God and he was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And they took him and he came as the savior and as the Messiah of the world. Remember he's talking to Jews too. Jesus the Messiah. And that he rose from the dead according to what Isaiah said. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He was preaching the whole gamut, if you will, about Jesus and the resurrection. So they thought he was strange. Think about it for a moment. If you were in a society, say you were Jewish and you grew up in a synagogue, you were taught the, you know, the Torah, you were taught all of the things of the Jewish religion, and you taught that uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I came to you and told you, hey, come on, I want to, meet, I want to show you a man who's God in human flesh. What are you going to call me? You're nuts! There's something wrong with you! How could God be in human flesh? You understand what I'm saying? Didn't make sense to them. But I told you, you don't have to understand something to believe something. Next verse, please. And they took him and they brought him unto Aropagus. Aropagus is a word that means Mars Hill. It's a place of high authority, a place where all of their law was decided. It was like the Supreme Court of the United States. They brought him there saying, may we know what this new teaching, this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. What am I getting at? First of all, Paul looked around and he saw Visual, he saw the city wholly given over to idolatry. And then he prayed and said, God, please send somebody to come and tell these poor people who are caught in idolatry. Did he pray? Did you, you, you see anywhere in this discourse where Paul prayed? When God stirs you to do something, do it. You're a brother, you come to me and you say, Pastor, I've got to get on a bus and I've got to go to New York. I, I mean, I got an appointment there and I don't have any money. And, and, and Pastor, I've, asked, I've kind of drained everybody out and I kind of asked everybody and they just don't have any money to give me. Is there any way you can give me money? And I come to him and I say, well, brother, I'll pray about it. I won't pray about it. You know what that is? That's just like saying no. Now, I'm going to give you an example about being stirred to do something versus having to pray about it. The Bible says, if you see a brother or a sister in need, and it's in your power to meet that need, go do it. You don't have to pray about it. Hello? So what stirs you is obedience to God's word. What stirs you to get involved in things for, the, you, know, for you as a Christian to be used of God? Some of you have great knowledge. Some of you have a lot of experience. What are you doing with it? That's your question. What are you doing with it? Are you debating other Christians? Just talking to other Christians? You can sit around and talk about He rose from the dead according to what Isaiah said. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He was preaching the whole gamut, if you will, about Jesus and the resurrection. So they thought he was strange. Think about it for a moment. If you were in a society, say you were Jewish and you grew up in a synagogue, you were taught the, you know, 
the Torah, you had taught all of the things of the Jewish religion, and you taught that uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I came to you and told you, hey, come on, I want to meet, I want to show you a man who's God in human flesh. What are you going to call me? You're nuts! There's something wrong with you! How could God be in human flesh? You understand what I'm saying? Didn't make sense to them. But I told you, you don't have to understand something to believe something. Next verse, please. And they took him and they brought him unto Aropagus. Aropagus is a word that means Mars Hill. It's a place of high authority, a place where all of their law was decided. It was like the Supreme Court of the United States. They brought him there saying, may we know what this new teaching, this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. What am I getting at? First of all, Paul looked around and he saw visual. He saw the city wholly given over to idolatry. And then he prayed and said, God, please send somebody to come and tell these poor people who are caught in idolatry. Did he pray? Did you, you, you see anywhere in this discourse where Paul prayed? No. When God stirs you to do something, do it. You're a brother, you come to me and you say, Pastor, I've got to get on a bus and I've got to go to New York. I, I mean, I got an appointment there and I don't have any money. And, and, and Pastor, I've asked, I've kind of drained everybody out and I kind of asked everybody and they just don't have any money to give me. Is there any way you can give me money? And I come to him and I say, well, brother, I'll pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. You know what that is? That's just like saying no. Now, I'm going to give you an example about being stirred to do something versus having to pray about it. The Bible says, if you see a brother or a sister in need, and it's in your power to meet that need, go do it. You don't have to pray about it. Hello? So what stirs you is obedience to God's word. What stirs you to get involved in things for, the, you, know, for you as a Christian to be used of God? Some of you have great knowledge. Some of you have a lot of experience. What are you doing with it? That's your question. What are you doing with it? Are you debating other Christians? Just talking to other Christians? You can sit around and talk about Jesus all day long until Jesus comes. You know what you're going to get for that? Pfft, nothing. Well, Jesus, we talked about you for six hours, three days a week, uh, for all my life. Oh, good for you. But Jesus, I won 40,000 debates. Good for you. What does that, what does that do for you? I remember one time, I just want to kind of get this story in. I remember one time I was um, working in North Pro I was working in Providence. Brother Bob and I worked at the same place. Um, what was that, Adolph Miller place? And there was a woman that was there, that worked there, and <clears throat> she said, I, I need a Bible. I need a Bible. And so I told her, I said, okay, I'll get you a Bible. So I went to the... Um, on Main Street there, there was a Bible, Bible bookstore there, there was a bookstore rather there. And, <clears throat> and I went in there, 